Hi, I, I suggest we can get started. We've got about 30 participants dialed in. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to my Caribbean colleagues. And good morning to my European colleagues. Welcome. I see some familiar names, so I'm happy to see you all joining in, and hopefully we'll have some more joining us. Um, so basically, this webinar is um, looking at the IUCN Green List of protected and conserved areas. And um, before I go ahead, I just introduce myself. I'm Hyacinth Armstrong Vaughan, and I am the coordinator of the Biodiversity and Protected Areas Management Program, or BioPama, as we call it, um, for the Caribbean. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with BioPama, it's an initiative of the Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific Group of States, and it's funded by the 11th European uh, funded under the 11th European Development Fund by the European Union. Um, the aim of BioPama is to build on progress, at least in this phase, to build on progress made in phase one, which ran from 2011 to 2017, um, to reinforce the management and governance of protected and conserved areas in the 79 Africa, Caribbean and Pacific countries through better use and monitoring of information and capacity development on management and governance. During this second phase, which runs from 2017 to 2023, the focus continues to be on improving management and governance of protected area sites through the promotion and continued application of management effectiveness to measure those improvements. So the IUCN Green List, as we call it, um, is a tool that can be used to promote continued improvement in protected areas management. And once a tool, once the standard is adopted by a country or juris jurisdiction, it becomes a point of reference that defines when that good management has been reached. So we wanted to take this opportunity um, early in phase two of BioPharma and following on from our inception meeting where we introduced the first introduced the green list to the, the region. There were some initial interests coming out of that from primarily the Nature Conservancy. So we wanted to take the opportunity to um, follow up on that interest um, and introduce the tool to the wider group of stakeholders in the Caribbean um, to get a sense of what the interest might be um, for advancing this process in the Caribbean. So this morning's session would be led by my colleague Dev, 
who's based in the Global Protected Areas Program in Switzerland and uh, for IUCN. Um, so Dev, who has agreed to set this up, thanks Dev. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to share this tool with, with us and seeing whether it's something that we can um, advance in the region, what's the potential for it. So Deb is gonna give us an overview of the green list of protected areas and conserved areas. And we will then open up the floor for discussion, starting primarily with um, our colleagues from TNC who had um, shared this initial interest um, and anybody else that may have questions or comments. And then we will continue the discussions and follow up from there. All right, so I won't take up much more time and I'll turn it over to Dev to give us an overview of the Green List. Great, thanks very much, Heisen. Heisen, just checking that you can hear me clearly. Yes, I'm hearing you clearly and I hope everyone is as well. Um, I Great. didn't check that before I started. <laughs> no, no problem. I can hear you loud and clear, so I think uh, everyone should be able to. And I'm generally muting everyone right now, but you should be able to unmute yourself. Um, and as Hyacinth mentioned, we will um, have some time at the uh, towards the halfway point of the webinar for discussion. Uh, but please do keep your microphones muted uh, during the presentation. Uh, we have about 30, just over 30 participants, so we don't have time to do introductions, but feel free to use the chat window if you want to just mention your name and organization. You can do that in the chat window. And if questions come to mind, you can also add questions in the chat window and we'll be, we'll be having a look at that. Yes, we'll monitor that. Great, thanks, Hyacinth. And uh, just so everybody knows, we are recording this webinar, so we will um, be able to put the recording up uh, online. Um, Hyacinth, where would it be available off of a Biopama? Um, we will determine that once we finish, most likely the Biopama website, but I will definitely let um, everyone know where it will be available once it is available. Great. As well. Or at least, or even the IUCN uh, regional office website. Yeah. yeah. Great, so thanks again everyone for joining and uh, as Hyacinth mentioned, I'm uh, with the Global Protected Areas Program uh, based out of IUCN's headquarters in Switzerland and I'm the community manager for the IUCN Green List. Uh, part of my role is uh, supporting and growing um, a increasing community of protected and conserved area practitioners that are interested in improving the management effectiveness and equitable governance of their areas. So um, as the byline says here, and, and as Hyacinth alluded to already, the, the Green List of Protected and Conserved Area Program is about promoting the achievement of successful area-based conservation outcomes in, at a site level. By way of a quick outline, I will cover very quickly some background in terms of where the IUCN Green List uh, comes from, what, it's, uh, what it speaks to uh, in terms of IUCN's program of work, and at the heart of the program is the global standard, uh, which I'll give you a, a quick overview of, and then explain the implementation process uh, as we implement the program in jurisdictions and countries around the world. I'll briefly touch upon some applications to the Biopama context and then uh, get into a, a bit of detail around how we could potentially implement uh, the Green List in the Caribbean context more specifically and then allow some time for, for discussion. Some of the images that you'll see in the in the background of the presentation are images from the pilot phase of the of the green list that recognized 25 sites around the world that achieved a green list status, and this was announced at the World Parks Congress in 2014. Okay, so. 
the green disk, as has been mentioned, is very much focused on the quality aspects of protected area and conserved area management. Many of us, um, and I will just make a point, sorry, before I get dive, before I get uh, dive into the presentation, that some of you may have attended the inception workshop in in Jamaica. So some of this, you would have seen some of these slides, uh, but some of you are new to this, so we're trying to speak to uh, an audience that may have seen some of this material before, but hopefully it's a good refresher um, about the green list, uh, but then there is some additional detail uh, towards the second half of the presentation. So some of you may be familiar with IHE Target 11, which is one of the IHE targets under the UN Convention on Biological Diversity um, that speaks to the targets that the signatories have established around 17% of terrestrial and inland water areas and 10% of coastal and marine areas being protected. An equally important aspect to this target to this target that's not often emphasized as much as the proportions are that these areas are conserved through effectively and equitably managed um, systems um, that are ecologically representative and well connected systems of protected areas and other effective area based conservation measures, considering uh, the wider landscape and seascape context and integrating into that. So in terms of the, the targets themselves, we are generally on track uh, for, we expect to meet these targets by 2020. Um, but in terms of the management aspects of these targets, we estimate globally based on some studies that only about a qu uh, one quarter of protected areas around the world are actually meeting sound management principles which means there's a, there's a risk that many of the areas that um, are established as protected areas are not necessarily delivering uh, fully on their, on their conservation objectives. And this is really what the, the Greenness program is trying to, to tackle. It's trying to provide a means through which these areas uh, can make commitments to improving management effectiveness for better conservation outcomes but also for, for better governance approaches and more inclusive governance approaches, which I'll explain um, and you'll see in, in the standard. The Greenness program has also been recognized uh, at the last CBD conference of parties, whereby there was a decision that invites parties to promote the IUCN Green List as a voluntary standard uh, for management effectiveness. Very quickly, IUCN works in three strategic areas. Our heartland work is valuing and conserving nature. This is where the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species sits, as well as the, the Green List, one of the newer initiatives of IUCN. But we also work in governance of natural resources and ensuring the equitable governance of natural resources and their effective governance to ensure that there's uh, benefits for, for communities from nature. And the third strategic area is around deploying nature-based solutions, so promoting the role of nature to address global sustainability challenges, such as the role of nature in climate change, mitigation and adaptation, disaster risk reduction, and the role of nature in contributing to improving food security, improving water security. Increasingly, we are framing this framing our work in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, um, specifically, of course, Target 14 and 15 directly related to biodiversity, but many other goals, as you see here, um, that link to IUCN's work. So the mission of the IUCN Green List is to increase and recognize the number of protected and conserved areas globally that are fairly governed, effectively managed, and achieving their conservation outcomes. So there's equal emphasis on not just recognizing areas that are well managed and are being inclusively or equitably governed, but also to increase the proportion of these areas that are, are actually achieving um, their conservation outcomes. 
so there's an equal emphasis in both recognition as well as increasing and there's um, a large emphasis on capacity development and this is also why it fits well within the within the biopharma context the program applies both to legally protected areas whether they're world heritage sites national parks state parks uh, municipal parks um, but also areas that um, are not necessarily legally protected but maybe but have defined uh, conservation management plans or functional equivalents so these could be community conservation areas or indigenously uh, indigenous community conservation areas as well ultimately the the program is about improving our knowledge and understanding of the natural and cultural values, if those are relevant, insights and understanding where exactly these are located, for whom these values are being protected and conserved, by whom and how are these being, how, how is this conservation happening, is it being, uh, is it resulting in actual conservation outcomes and in fair and equitable means for the benefit of nature and communities that depend. So the Green List is the first global standard around defining, according to IUCN technical guidelines, what is the direction we want to see protected areas to be um, moving towards, towards, towards making commitments to improving management and equitable governance. And the standard provides a means and a direction through which to do this. It was based on a resolution that uh, came out of IUCN's World Conservation Congress in 2012 and went through a pilot phase that concluded in the World Pox Congress in 2014. And you can probably see the text here. It's a bit small, but it's really just to give you an idea of the global spread um, of, different, of eight countries around the world where the Green List uh, program was, was piloted. And uh, between 2014 and the World Conservation Congress in 2016, there were several rounds of public consultation with regards to the standard. And the standard also went through um, the application of codes of good practice for, for standard setting. Um, and it's important to emphasize here that we are promoting the standard as a sustainability standard because it equally emphasizes conservation outcomes, but also governance. And so the image here actually um, shows you the, the four components of the standard, uh, three foundational components around uh, starting with good governance, sound design and planning, and the third component being effective management. Um, putting these foundational components together create successful conservation outcomes, which is the fourth component. So there's a version 1.1 of the standard now available at iocn.org slash greenlist and an accompanying user manual. And there's an information system um, that um, I can ex I'll explain a, a bit uh, later, but essentially there's a cloud-based system um, that uploads information from sites. And then the sites get a, um, have information that's publicly, uh, there's a public summary of why sites get greenlisted and that's uh, put on protectedplanet.net, which is the World Database on, on Protected Areas, the public-facing portal. So what's the, what is the standard itself? The standard, as I mentioned, is, is four components, and it's a total of 17 criteria divided into these four components. Um, so, so you can think of these criteria as, as conditions, as conditions that uh, sites that commit to the green list will have to meet and uh, sites have to meet all 17 criteria so you can't have a site that's doing well just on good governance or just on conservation outcomes uh, but the requirement is that sites are able um, to provide evidence um, that will indicate that they're meeting all 17 of these criteria so just to give you an idea on the on the good governance component there's three conditions around guaranteeing legitimacy and voice, achieving transparency and accountability, 
enabling governance vitality and capacity to respond adaptively. Um, these are just the titles of the criteria. The standard itself is, is more detailed and there's accompanying uh, text that, um, that explains in, in more detail uh, what, what these um, conditions specifically require these sites um, to, to achieve. This is also based on, on um, decades of IUCN's experience in, produ in uh, producing some of these technical guidelines that you see at the bottom here, um, such as technical guidelines or best practice guidelines around governance of protected areas, guidelines for applying protected area management categories, and guidelines around management effectiveness. But uh, the standard is not just about promoting IUCN tools and approaches, uh, it's really about also recognizing uh, other tools that may be being used uh, as long as they're providing information and delivering um, against achieving the standard, any system or any tool uh, could be used uh, to implement uh, to implement the green list standard. We're also, particularly around the conservation outcomes component, we're also trying to make um, connections to some of the IUCN, other IUCN knowledge products such as the IUCN Red List um, and a new global standard on key biodiversity areas that recognizes um, important areas for biodiversity for, their glo for the global persistence of biodiversity. So that gives you an idea of the standard. Again, for the sake of time, we're not, we're not going to get into uh, a detailed view of the standard, but that standard is available. It's a, it's a document of about 40 pages, um, which includes the criteria and supporting indicators, which I'll explain um, in a second. Uh, but that's available at iucn.org slash green list. So how does the implementation work? The first step of implementing the Greenness program in a jurisdiction, so typically the jurisdictions are at a country level, uh, but depending on the geographic context, we're also starting regional approaches. So as by way of an example, we are implementing in the North Africa region uh, through a regional implementation process that's um, implementing simultaneously in three countries in the North Africa region. This is Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria. It starts with commitments uh, either from sites uh, directly, so um, it is a voluntary program. Uh, we are looking for, for commitments and interest at a, at a site level. Um, so there's um, commitments that come from um, site managers or park directors, uh, or there can also be commitments from civil society organizations or NGOs that are supporting parks and sites to improve management effectiveness or governance and want to introduce um, the green list standard um, in their work to these to these parks. So we get commitments typically from uh, an NGO partner and a, and a government protected area agency in a jurisdiction that are interested in, in, in working together um, to bring the green list to the jurisdiction with IUCN's support and the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas, we convene a local expert, um, which we call the EAGLE. It's the Expert Assessment Group for the Green List. Uh, this is a group of local experts with local, or let's say, uh, jurisdictional knowledge. Uh, so in a national context, for instance, it would be um, experts that have um, knowledge in that particular region of issues related to governance or management effectiveness, uh, issues related to uh, to the standard, and I'll exp I'll get into this um, a bit more um, towards the end of the presentation. Um, IUCN will then accredit and train these um, members of the expert group. Uh, IUCN also will select the the members um, after an open public call. Um, the EAGLE members then have an opportunity to adapt the global standards. So the global standard that I mentioned has 17 criteria, uh, but underlying these criteria, there's a, on average about three indicators for, this, for these criteria um, that really indicate to sites what kind of information 
is is needed uh, in terms of evidence from sites uh, that they're needed to provide in order to demonstrate compliance with these with these criteria. Um, but we want to make sure that the that the standard is locally relevant. So there's an opportunity to adapt these indicators to the local context, and this goes through a public consultation. And then there's an approved version that goes to sites who have made the commitment and then they go through an implementa implementing the process. Uh, this includes um, doing a self-assessment against the standard and also engaging uh, stakeholders as well through the process. This gives you a quick overview of how sites implement the program once they've received uh, the, uh, the full standard. So once they have that set of adapted indicators, they, they enter into an application phase, uh, which where they provide, um, they do a, conduct a self-assessment against those first three foundational components of the standard. And um, they identify the stakeholders, um, which is typical in any case um, for, for um, management plan um, or management effectiveness evaluation. The sites will then enter into a candidacy phase, which is where they provide evidence against all of the criteria. This includes the fourth component around the requirements to demonstrate successful conservation um, of those natural and cultural values where relevant. Um, there's also requirement in this phase for consultations with stakeholders and uh, to receive a site visit from a representative of the, um, of the eagle, of the expert group. They're then admitted to, if they're um, evaluated by the Eagle and um, judged to be meeting the Greenlist standard, that recommendation comes to an IUCN Global Greenlist Committee. That's a final checkpoint, uh, but it's expected to, um, to abide by the recommendations of these jurisdictional Eagles. And then they're admitted to a Greenlist phase, uh, which lasts for a period of five years. And um, there's a midterm review in case any conditions on the ground um, have changed. Um, and in case they're not, then the, that should be a quick process. And at the end of that five year, there's a renewal review. And this is to allow for opportunities uh, for changing circumstances and to make sure that these areas are actually performing at that high standard. But also we expect that the standard will evolve um, over time. It's based on current knowledge and science around good practice. Um, but the standard, um, as with all good um, multi-stakeholder standards, we expect will will evolve and um, and raise the bar as well in the future. So we expect the standard to be open for public consultation about every four years. I mentioned the the data management side of this. Uh, I think for the interest of time, I'm not going to spend more time just just to note that there's an internal system um, whereby sites upload information and then there's a, the public portal for the sites is on protectedplanet.net and this information is also expected to address some um, significant data gaps um, in management effectiveness information. Very quickly, some of the, the values we're seeing from, the, from sites joining the Greenless program starting with the global recognition for successful management um, in protected and conserved areas, but also the, the usefulness of, being, of, be, of a comparison and evaluation against a credible global standard um, that IUCN provides. Um, through the program, we also provide access to experts um, in the form of the Eagle evaluators, uh, but also there are um, implementing partners for the green list that also provide some support um, and receive some training in terms of pro um, implementing the program. We are doing this very closely in partnership with the World Commission on Protected Areas, as I mentioned uh, before, that are voluntary members. Um, so we're hoping to, to, to keep the process cost effective. It is not a commercial standard. Um, it's public and open access, but they're um, the main costs really are associated with um, covering the um, logistical costs for, for the EGLE operation, but EGLE members um, are, are volunteers. 
there are requirements in the in the standard for to cons for the sites to consider connectivity issues, to consider the the wider land and seascape uh, context, but also through the stakeholder engagement process, we expect um, that the through the implementation of the standard that um, sites will um, also make greater consideration around um, around the landscape and well, in the Caribbean context, the seascape context uh, is just as important. There is also some media attention that comes with the Green List program and we have seen that this can provide some vigilance if, um, if there are uh, certain threats or pressures on protected areas, um, there's, there's a means um, through the, some of the monitoring requirements standard where some of these um, some of these pressures and threats could be potentially addressed or at least highlighted and lastly uh, the the program is uh, as I mentioned at the start um, is about is expect is a a short way of contributing to to global sustainability goals specifically IHE target 11 we will have a green list um, event at the next CBD COP in, in Egypt, where we will be announcing jurisdictions uh, that are joining the Greenlist program. And as I've mentioned, the Greenlist is also recognized in a, in a CBD COP decision. Okay, just wrapping up um, with a few slides here in terms of the Greenlist context in, in sorry, the greenest in the Biopama context, as uh, Hyacinth mentioned, uh, Biopama Phase Two has uh, has one of, has an objective and emphasis on site-based site actions, particularly around management and governance priorities. And we expect the Greenlist program and its standard is a, can serve as a potential diagnostic tool for sites that um, commit to the Greenlist program. Um, in terms of understanding where they stand and um, against the IUCN standard and what might be some of the gaps, uh, both in terms of management and, and governance um, aspects that they may need to implement. So just as a, um, by way of a very quick example of how the reference information systems can serve as useful information sources uh, for sites that may commit to the to the greenest program. Um, this is just an example from Jamaica. This was used uh, as an example at the time when uh, we, this was a local nearby national park when at the inception meeting in uh, in Kingston. Um, but these Reference information systems can can provide um, information around major site values, um, links to to a management plan, current state threats, pressures, and um, some of these sites uh, I understand have also done management effectiveness assessments, um, such as using the IMET approach, the Integrated Management Effectiveness Tool. That's being um, that's one of the tools uh, promoted for management effectiveness evaluation um, in the Biopama program globally. And in turn, there are requirements in the standard that whereby information will be collected, and that information um, can also add to to the reference information system. So um, there's a mutually beneficial. Um, arrangement that could come between these two these two systems. There's also potential application of the action component, uh, the, which is still uh, I mean that the, the uh, is still somewhat in in a in a design uh, phase. But one potential application of the action grant uh, or the grant facilities can be um, grants that enable sites. Uh, that would take actions based on on a diagnostic that um, could come from the that would come from the greenlist process, um, as I mentioned earlier, to improve management effectiveness and governance. Um, so you could actually have action grants that could help um, sites move between between these phases. I will mention that the that these phases uh, um, there's no pressure for sites to move uh, between these phases. The phases are the sites choose when they want to move. Uh, and when they're ready with the information and evidence 
they choose when they're ready to be evaluated by the eagle. Uh, but we um, we do have a time limit in terms of sites are expected to move from application phase to the greenness phase within within a period of five years, a maximum period of five years. The potential regional approach uh, that I alluded to is probably what's better suited for the Caribbean region, given you're dealing with um, smaller island states um, and also states with, um, with that may have similar uh, context. Um, so just to, as we get into to the, the discussion here, um, some of the, the, the key steps that would be required for, to implement the green list would be establishing this a regional green list hub. This would uh, involve having commitments from sites or at least organizations that want to implement the green list program um, in the Caribbean region or uh, potentially a sub-region of the Caribbean region, which is a large region. And as I and then defining the actual um, jurisdiction that would make sense in um, in the Caribbean context, um, we've heard from TNC that Eastern Caribbean could be one possible sub-region that we could put, potentially pilot the program in, and then um, engage with other regions as well. And then it would be important to identify who would be implementing partners in this jurisdiction and securing some resources, both in kind and uh, and some small financial resources to initiate the greenness process. And then forming eagles is really the key step and provides the key infrastructure through which a greenness uh, program is implemented in a jurisdiction. So I've, I've covered some of this. I'll just quickly indicate that uh, eagles are a diverse group of local experts. Um, they are typically from a from a diverse uh, set of backgrounds as well. So we often we will have um, non-governmental organizations, government representatives, academic representatives, community representatives. What would be relevant um, in the jurisdictional context? It's the eagle, as I mentioned, that reviews the material and and will uh, conduct site visits, and then it's the eagle that makes recommendations um, to the IUCN Global Greenlist Committee. The selection process is coordinated between IUCN's World Commission and Protected Area. The IUCN Secretariat also supports this process and an implementing partner. It's a simple process where we just ask for personal statements, CV, and self-evaluation of expertise. It's um, all provided in a, in a package that we send out that's a call for expressions of interest. Um, implementing partners can, act, can ask for applications and provide feedback on, on um, individuals that apply to the pro, uh, to to be considered to be eagle members but the final decision on the eagle composition is made by IUCN and an independent reviewer that's a third party reviewer to make sure we're following all the rules in the program i was asked just to give an indication of what are the expectations for for eagle members uh, and a lot of this there's a lot more detail in the user manual uh, but this is about six to eight working days per year. We ask Eagle members to, to commit uh, for about two years. So we're talking about a half day um, a month. There's um, a requirement to attend a two-day, ideally in-person training uh, that will be conducted by IUCN and um, the assurance provider, that's Accreditation Services International. And we expect that the Eagle will meet for at least once uh, for a two-day evaluation meeting where they, where they will evaluate the material once that's ready from sites. And I've mentioned that Eagle members conduct the site visits. So why be an Eagle member and why volunteer time? We expect that Eagle members are already working in, in protected area management effectiveness um, or protected and conserved area governance issues. So this is an opportunity to contribute to advancing the effectiveness of these areas the management of these areas in, in your region uh, through personal and professional experience and applying best practice based on IUCN's experience. The Eagle members themselves serve in an individual capacity, but it's an opportunity for, uh, um, for Eagle members to represent the interests of your particular stakeholder group. 
uh, you'll also become a member of the ISN World Commission on Protected Areas and be part of a growing global protected area community. With that, I am going to leave it here. So we have at least uh, 20 minutes for questions and discussions. And Hyacinth, I might check in with you or with TNC if you wanted to have some words from TNC. All right, thanks, Dev, um, for that overview and introduction to the Green List and um, going into a little detail on what could be possible if um, we as a region or sub-region was interested in advancing this process. Um, Shanique, I don't know if you wanted to give a few comments. Shanique um, is part of the TNC Bahamas team, and as I indicated um, earlier, TNC had shown interest in the potential for this process in the region uh, following the inception meeting, and um, through them and through the discussions with Dev, this is how we came to this point of having um, starting with this webinar on, on the green list. So I don't know if Shanique wants to give a few comments or thoughts and then we can open up to everyone else to share their thoughts, questions, and go from there. And Shanique, are you still with us? Hi, Shanique. I, I see that you're unmuted, but we can't hear you in case you can hear us. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, morning, everyone. I'm Shanique Smith from the Bahamas Program for the Nisha Conservancy. Um, and my colleague, Sherry Constantine from the Eastern Caribbean program actually asked me to say a few words on her behalf. She gives her apologies. She's not able to make this call this morning. Um, so I would just like to say TNC is excited about the potential for the green lists in the region. Um, as many of you would know, we have been working on the Caribbean Challenge Initiative in the region for many, many years. And one component of that um, Caribbean Challenge is or declaration of protected areas, but but beyond that, the effective management of protected areas. So we see a lot of, of potential for synergies with that program. Um, additionally, we've also been looking at getting sustainable funding for protected areas, which contributes significantly to advancing effective management. So we um, we see ourselves um, possibly dovetailing with the Green List program where possible as it meets in with the Caribbean challenge. We also think, you know, the Conservancy can assist if this is something that countries are interested in, can provide some technical support, um, possibly even beyond an eagle if we have it in the region. I do think that um, a full regional eagle is not likely or not, I don't think it would perhaps be best. Um, Sherry has suggested it's possible for the Eastern Caribbean. I think um, the Bahamas would, would see itself needing something of its own if, if it was, um, there was more discussion on that. So that's it for me. And we really would like to hear what our thoughts from others on the potential and interest for this program. Thanks, Shani. Um, so I think at this point, uh, we can open it up to the wider audience, to get any comments or feedback from, from any of you on what has been presented. Okay, I see a comment from Susan in the chat, uh, since no one is unmuting to speak at the moment. So Susan Davis um, from Jamaica is indicating that a likely question to be asked by countries currently applying for applying the ICN management effectiveness tracking tool developed by Hawkins et al. is how is this green list standard different? So I guess that's a question to Dev. Yeah, sure, that's a, that's a good question. The, they're not, Different, I would say. Well, they're they're very complementary. The, um, the management effectiveness tracking tool will provide information um, around um, how a, how a site is doing, 
um, against its management objectives. Um, and it said, as set out in its, in its latest management plan, for instance. But what the IUCN standard is doing is that it's actually providing direction um, in terms of what, in IUCN's view, would be considered to reach a high level of performance uh, with regards to making sure that those management objectives, for instance, are consistent with the IUCN protected area management category that relates to that site um, or that the, um, that the site is actually uh, providing evidence that the conservation values that are being identified um, on the, um, in the site um, are actually being maintained or, or um, even, even enhanced through um, some monitoring requirements such as establishing performance thresholds. Um, so the so the idea is for is for the the greenlist standard to to be able to provide um, a, a, a benchmark. Um, I mean, I, I I do see also that we have Bastian Burtsky, I think dialed in. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Bastian, but if you want to speak, um, feel free to, to to come in on connections between management effectiveness evaluations and the green list. Sure. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, can hear you clear. Uh, thanks, Best. Okay, thanks, Steph. Um, yeah, I was just listening in. Um, I'm with the Bioparma team here at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. We're based in Italy. And um, maybe just to add on uh, what uh, Dev said, I think, you know, I, I fully agree with what you said. I mean, the green is it provides a broader umbrella um, vision um, and, and direction for where to go in terms of governance, management, conservation outcomes. And then there are multiple tools that can help you to assess um, where you stand and uh, with regard to the different elements, governance, management, and, and biodiversity and, and social outcomes and so on. And, and MET and other tools are available, you know, to maybe assess um, the component on a management effectiveness. And then there are other tools to help you do a governance assessment, a social assessment and, and things like that. So I would fully agree with your um, assessment that, you know, MET, MET is one of the tools that can, can be used to measure progress towards meeting the green list uh, criteria. And in itself is a, is a useful exercise. And there are others such as the IMED tool that we developed um, so far for application in, in Western and Central Africa to many protected areas there and in Bolivia, Northern Africa. And that is another tool that could be used to measure progress. But um, the Green List provides a broader framework and vision for a protected area to um, uh, thrive towards. Thanks, Bastian. Thanks, Dev. Um, I see we have some more questions in the chat. So Victoria K, which wanted to know what would be the difference between a country eagle and a region eagle? Sure. Uh, there's they serve they serve. There's there's no actual difference. They would serve the same function. The the eagles really perform the evaluation, um, and it's really uh, the it's really what jurisdiction make sense in the particular region. So I think, for instance, uh, Shanik mentioned it might make sense for the Bahamas to to have um, an eagle, um, or it could make sense to cover a few more states. Um, so given that we're talking about smaller states in, in this region, it could make sense to have a, an Eastern Caribbean re region, and then they would be, um, we would make sure that the Eastern Caribbean region has representation of experts that would not just be Bahama Bahama experts, but also experts from other parts of the from other states of the Eastern Caribbean, and then they would be uh, trained to evaluate applications from sites um, in that region. Um, so, in, in in other parts of the world, such as Colombia or China, we have uh, national eagles uh, because there's enough uh, because these are large countries and there's enough. Um, requirements for expertise uh, that would um, be needed and eagle size is typically about uh, it can range from anywhere between five individuals to to about 15 individuals thanks Deb. i guess i'll just piggyback on that before i go on to some of the other questions so then would you say that an eagle having an eagle will depend on the size of your jurisdiction whether it's a national eagle versus a regional eagle, the benefit of that? 
Uh, sorry, could you just repeat that, Heisen? I'm looking for that. Question. So no, I was. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I was wondering if, uh, following on on um, yeah. your response, if you can determine whether you need a national eagle versus a regional eagle based on the size of your jurisdiction, or the jurisdictions to be covered. Yeah, it could be it could be size, or it can also be based on the on the commitments that are coming in. So. Um, for example, in the North Africa region, we're dealing with a really large area between three large countries, Algeria, Morocco, and the smaller country of Tunisia. But um, the, the government agencies in that region um, want to see initially what, the, um, what, what are the values and the, what's the experience of the sites uh, that enter into the Greenlist program. Um, so we formed, so because we, we only have about one or two sites that have committed to the Greenlist program in these three countries. So we formed a, a regional eagle of 15 members where we have five individuals from each country and um, they're being trained together because these three countries all, also deal with fairly similar contexts with regards to the protected and conserved areas um, in this region. And uh, the expectation is, is that as more sites hopefully join the Greenlist and see the value of being part of the program, that the regional eagle will then likely break up into national eagles. And then you'll have five trained individuals in each of these eagles, uh, but then we could potentially add more eagle members. Um, so generally, if a, if a region is interested in showing, in looking at an initial pilot in the region, I think a regional eagle could make sense. And then if you've got, um, so if you've got a few sites in a few different parts of that region going through the program and then um, you could see further down the road if national eagles would make would make sense. I th from what I've um, seen in the in the Caribbean region, I think a, um, a regional eagle for a part of the Caribbean would be would be the the way to start. Okay, thanks, Dev. Um, Marvin Vasquez wanted to know some from Yachi Conservation Trust wants to know if existing KBAs can be regarded as default areas for greenness for the greenness. Right, so the not necessarily defaults. Um, the the greenness program recognizes that all values are important. So these could be globally important values that uh, could fall under key biodiversity areas, um, and not all of the key biodiversity areas are necessarily uh, protected or or conserved areas. Um, so these areas need to be being managed with conservation mm -hmm. objectives. Um, but you, so you could have KBAs uh, that would um, be, um, sorry, you could have natural values that would, would be key biodiversity areas. Um, but it's really up to the, to the site to commit to the greenness program. So um, it really, that commitment has to come from the site. So you could also have areas that are not key biodiversity areas, but have recognized that they have locally important values. Uh, that they're conserving, but they want to commit to to the greenness program to make sure that they're successfully conserving uh, those values and that they're uh, governing those areas in in equitable ways. So hopefully that that answers the question. Okay. All right. We have a couple more questions in the comment. Um, so Augustine Dominique joined us late, so he wanted to know if this was covered or not. What are the benefits? of commitment to the green list for small island developing states. Sure, I mean, I've spoken to some of the global benefits we've seen. Hyacinth, I wonder if you want to speak to, to the particular regional benefits you could see maybe in the context of, of Biopama or? Well, I, I think it ties back into what you indicated for the global uh, perspective, which is, you know, measuring, um, yeah, if you could go back to the slides, <laughs> uh, but basically measuring um, the commitments that we have made, for example, under the IG targets, 11, um, IG target 11, which is coming due in two years, pretty much, uh, getting a sense of where countries are, are at in meeting those commitments. Um, as Shanique indicated, um, with the TNC through the Caribbean Challenge Initiative, um, trying to achieve um, 
the establishment of, of new sites and exactly when we do establish those sites, how do we manage them properly and make sure they are being uh, meeting the conservation goals. I think from the small island developing states, um, it would be good for us to have uh, well, at least use the Greenlist standard as a, a start for us in the Caribbean. Um, and that's where Biopama comes in as well um, in improving the governance and management of our protected areas. Um, we've done a lot of assessments across the region in some way or measure, primarily through projects, but there's no consistency. Um, once the project is over, there's no continuation of that monitoring and evaluation of how well our sites are doing. So if there is this move to adopt the green list standard, then there is an overarching um, benchmark to which countries and sites can work towards outside of a project goal or objective um, that says, you know, that forces them, I guess, in a way to continuously monitor themselves and, and make sure that they are meeting the objectives that they protected area was set up for in the first place. Um, so I guess I did that in a roundabout way, but um, there is, I think, some value to SIDS for the green list once we can um, have the necessary, <clears throat> necessary resources available to support the work that's required on the ground. Yeah. Thanks, Heisen. I'll just add, I think there's also, I think there's, yeah, there's, it's, it's also about joining a, a global community and have, and being part of a community that will, um, also go beyond the the time period of Biopama. Biopama also has a has a has a certain duration, um, and the the greenest program we hope will will provide will provide a means um, through which we can engage with the Biopama community, of course, um, but also that the program will um, the greenest program will continue as it's one of a, a major initiative um, coming out of out of IUCN. Um, I do see there's a question here about the, and maybe this could be one of the last questions. I think there was someone else that wanted to comment. We'll, so I'll, comment, try to, yes. mm -hmm. I'll try to answer this very quickly, but okay. from the point of view of the, of the site manager, if they're interested in their site becoming a green list area, um, it is, yeah, the, the um, they would, they would, we could send them the registration um, link, but it is important that an eagle is formed in the jurisdiction. Um, but they're still able to, to register their interest in the green list, and that's, uh, that does help us make the case for forming uh, an eagle in a certain jurisdiction. So um, I can send, I'll send Hyacinth maybe, um, we can put up the, the link to site registrations for interest in the green list when we post the, the webinar. Mm -hmm. We can put that link there and also, um, uh, the other point is that they, um, the tool itself, we don't recommend um, one particular tool, but the standard itself is open and public access. So you, the site managers can have a look at the, at the standard. It's the full, the full standard that would be the 17 criteria and the indicators. Um, and that's available on ivcn.org slash green list. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, let's give Lucy a chance to come in before we wrap up. Uh, Lucy, go ahead. Yes, yes thank you so much. Um, so my name is Lucy Labouz. I work for the Specially Protected Areas and Wildlife Regional Activity Center. Um, so this uh, Specially Protected Areas and Wildlife is a protocol under the Cartagena Convention. That's the regional agreement in the Caribbean for the protection and development of the marine environment um, that aim to achieve sustainable development of marine and coastal resources. But even if I know, I guess you already know that. Um, I just wanted to underline that there is a strong link here to be done, I think, uh, with the work that is conducted by the SPOP protocol and the Cartagena Convention, which uh, lists uh, 32 protected areas under SPO, uh, meaning that there are a strong interest um, for the Caribbean region. And so the, all the, um, the protocol for the protected areas to be listed in Odospo is um, available in, and it's like um, special protected areas that are targeted as especially important. And I guess that could somehow fit with the green list. So I think that's something we should maybe keep in mind and try to see how we can um, just join the effort and maybe work together on this. Um, just, well, that's yeah. something I wanted to, to mention. 
Absolutely, that sounds uh, very relevant, and thanks for that comment. Um, can I just request that if you could send that, if you could send us some information about that at greenlist at iucn.org. That's the email address here on the slide. If you if you could send that to us, then we can follow up. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. And now, just for your benefit as well, we under Biopharma, we have been working with um, the Caribbean Environment Program, which is the secretariat for the SPORT protocol, or the Cartagena Convention, sorry, and um, the SPORT protocol. So um, we also have that um, working relationship that we can build on through the program with what Lucy just um, mentioned. Great. Uh, I do see maybe one last, just to take this last comment, I see there is a reference to Belize and the Selva Maya region. That's great, actually. Yeah, we are uh, bringing the green list through the Selva Maya project with um, Jose Corral, who's um, yes. Hyacinth's colleague in, in the regional office. So thanks for pointing that. And yes, they could eventually become part of, a, of the National Eagle for Belize as that um, process grows in Belize. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right, everybody, I think we're just up on the hour time for this webinar. Um, so just to follow up on, um, I think this was a good session. Thank you, Dev, for sharing um, an overview of the green list and for participants for uh, tuning in and sharing your comments and questions. Um, under Biopharma, as I said, this is um, the green list is a standard to which we are hoping we can work towards. Uh, I'm happy to see that there is interest in the in the region towards adopting this in some way. Um, so our next steps um, at within Biopharma would be one, we will share this webinar with you, but we will also be having at the end of June a workshop to um, look at management effectiveness, start the process again of looking at management effectiveness in the Caribbean, what has happened, where do we need to go, because as was indicated in the presentation and through comments and questions, there are many tools available for us to do management effectiveness. Some are relevant and have been used quite widely in the Caribbean, some have not, um, but bearing in mind that the tools are there to help us um, measure how well we're doing and identify where we need to be working on in our areas and that's what Biopharma is aiming to, to, work, to work on in the region and improve. So we'll have this workshop at the end of June, June 25th to the 27th in St. Lucia. Um, a few of you have, well, all countries have been invited. Unfortunately, we can't have everybody present. I'm working to see whether we can have some kind of virtual participation or recordings of the sessions, depending on, on what our capacity is. But we will be advancing, um, starting the review of management effectiveness in the Caribbean. The green list will be revisited again uh, in a little bit more detail as well. Um, so stay tuned for more information on, on these outcomes from that session and on how we would potentially want to go forward in the Caribbean with this um, uh, process of green listing, or at least using the green list in the Caribbean to support our work here. All right, so thanks everyone, thanks Dev. Um, Thank you, Hyacinth, and thanks, uh, really good questions and uh, great Good to see such a number of, of participants. So we will share the presentation. Uh, at least I'll make a PDF available, Hyacinth, with the webinar recording. Yes. And, yes. So uh, all of this will be available, and I will um, we will circulate it as widely as possible. Because yeah. um, I know there were some who couldn't attend that were interested. Great. Well, we're looking forward to engaging uh, with the global programs. Looking forward to engaging in this region. So thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks again, Dev. Thanks everyone. And have a good day and good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.